time. Uh, and just uh, to note that the briefing is being live streamed on the International AIDS Conference YouTube channel. Um, and we will also be archiving the recording uh, for possible later viewing. We're here this morning to focus on, I think, what is very much sort of mushroomed out of Vancouver last year and, and I think being set in stone here at Durban that oral print is alive and well and very much with us. The question is just really how quickly we can get it out to those people in the world who really need it. Um, and a key theme in this week's conference is really moving science from the proof to the practice. Uh, I think you're, you're starting to get the feeling that you know oral print is the one that really feel very strongly about, um, as well as anatomical, um, again, not forgetting vaginal depivering ring as well. Despite the strong science supporting PrEP, its implementation in the real world has been quite limited, uh, mostly due to availability. Uh, and just this week, we uh, saw the report from UNAIDS showing that 2% of the way towards reaching the UNAIDS goal of having 3 million people on PrEP by 2020. So there really is a great deal of work to be done. Um, many important questions do remain. How to implement, how to get it to the right people. And you'll be hearing quite a lot more during this conference as people actually do implement uh, demonstrations, you know, um, projects that are helping us uh, understand how to scale up. And this is particularly important, I think, in this region where, as you've just heard a number of times in the last 48 hours, how many infections we're having, particularly amongst key pops and, and young women and adolescent girls, even here in this country. So just as the 2000 International AIDS Conference in Durban is, um, you know, sort of ushered in the notion of treatment expansion, we're really hoping that 2016 will be about the expansion of prevention and um, at large, and of course PrEP within that prevention uh, movement. So we have a great lineup of people, uh, everybody from uh, those who are watching the scale up and monitoring it and, and uh, coming back to account for it, as well as those who have led and uh, been involved in, in PrEP demonstrations and other kinds of research. So it's my great pleasure in the first instance to introduce to you Scott McAllister from Gilead Sciences. As you know, Gilead is the originator of Truvada, um, and this currently is the drug that is licensed uh, in now in seven countries for the, the indication of prevention. Scott leads the PrEP clinical research program, as well as other HIV clinical research efforts. Um, and so we've asked him to come today to just give a few remarks on the study he's presenting, but more specifically on the scale-up of a PrEP across the world. Scott. Thank you, Linda Gill. So um, I'm from Gilead Sciences, and uh, the study that I'm going to show in a, a couple of hours uh, simply describes implementation and uh, quantification of Truvada for PrEP inside the United States. As most of you know, I think um, Truvada for PrEP was approved in July of 2012 inside the United States, and uh, it was the, the, the first preventive that was available. What we did to try and quantify use was uh, look at the national prescription database inside the United States, and then we applied a uh, complex algorithm that uh, weeded out and, and filtered uh, individuals who might be taking Truvada for hepatitis B, uh, individuals who might be taking Truvada as part of chronic HIV treatment, and individuals who might be taking uh, Truvada for post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, at the end of the day, uh, through from 2012 to 2015, uh, uh, all, all four years, the number of individuals taking Truvada for PrEP, these are unique individuals, was 79,684 inside the U.S. The, the first two years, 2012 and 2013, the numbers were fairly flat. And then toward the end of 2013 and into 14 and 15, it increased uh, fairly significantly, uh, such that uh, 
when you look at the last quarter of 2015 compared to the last quarter of 2012 inside the U.S., there was a 738% increase in Truvada for PrEP use. Um, one of the important uh, uh, subsets that we looked at was uh, men and women. The number of women increased uh, slightly uh, from about uh, 2,300 or so in the, in the first year to about 7,000 in the fourth year. In contrast, the number of men increased dramatically. Um, and in fact, of the 79,000, we have about 61,000 men, and, and the rest are about 18,800 and uh, some are women. So w what that suggests to, to us is that uh, while men are uh, using Truvada for PrEP a lot inside the U.S., uh, women are not implementing it quite as much. We also looked at age. The average age uh, of Truvada for PrEP users inside the U.S. was about 36 years across all four years. Interestingly, about 28% of, of women were uh, using Truvada for PrEP were under the age of 25, whereas only 11% of men uh, using Truvada for PrEP were under the age of 25. We also broke it down by uh, regions and states and cities, uh, the details of which um, I think are probably too much for, for right now, but uh, one of the important findings I do want to comment on is that uh, of the uh, highest lifetime risk of HIV inside the U.S., which is primarily in some of the southeastern states, places like Washington, D.C., uh, the state of Maryland, Baltimore in particular, uh, rates of Truvada for PrEP use were not as high as we might have liked to have seen them. The cities that were using it uh, uh, at, at much higher rates, San Francisco, Chicago, New York City, um, were uh, not necessarily the highest lifetime risk. So I think the take home point from, from our, that I think is important from the presentation is that it, use has increased dramatically from 2012 to 2015. Um, the number of men uh, vastly outnumbers the number of women using. And um, it's important, I think, uh, as we do more implementation activities across the U.S., that we pay attention to. Uh, access to care for women, access to care for individuals under the age of 25, and access to care for uh, states inside the U.S. that uh, have higher lifetime risk of HIV but are not yet using it. Scott, thank you very much. And uh, quickly moving on then to some of the demonstration projects. And I, I was actually at the hearing in 2012. It was the first time I'd ever been to an FDA hearing. It was in, incredibly uh, important day in my own life, um, but one of the studies that was p formed part of the evidence for that hearing for licensure of Truvada was in fact the Partners PrEP study. Now that moved on to a demonstration, and Jared and his colleague Connie Kellum, uh, they have been really instrumental in designing, implementing, and, and making sure those studies come to fruition, and at this conference, Jared is presenting the final data on the partners demonstration project, which is, Jared, a, a sort of a bridge to suppressed antiretroviral care. I'll ask you to comment on that. Great. Thank you. And uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. I am here on behalf of the partners demonstration project team. PrEP has been demonstrated to be effective in clinical trials for HIV prevention, but delivery strategies to make it available have not yet been developed in all settings. For HIV serodiscord in couples, a population that was integral to the, de to the development of PrEP for prevention, both treatment and PrEP can be effective strategies, and a delivery strategy that helps them work together would be potentially most optimal. And this is because not all couples initiate treatment immediately, and not all couples would use PrEP, and so one that puts them together might synergize. Between November of 2012 and June of this year, just last month, we conducted an implementation program study delivering PrEP and ART to serodiscordant couples um, in Kenya and Uganda. This was called the Partners Demonstration Study. Both PrEP and ART were offered to all couples. PrEP was continued until ART had been initiated and used for six months, allowing time for viral suppression, and then PrEP was recommended to be discontinued. Sometimes PrEP was used longer if a couple didn't want to initiate ART immediately, for example, um, and then the bridge was extended couples were followed for a total of two years. 
We enrolled 1,013 couples at four sites in Kenya and Uganda. Two thirds had an HIV negative male partner, 20% were under 25 years of age, and two thirds were not using condoms. These were high risk couples and none had participated in the earlier clinical trial of PrEP. This was a demonstration project, not a clinical trial. 97% of the couples when offered PrEP accepted it, and adherence was high, more than 80% by blood testing. Over time, 91% of HIV positive partners initiated ART, although about half delayed for six months or more. But put together, PrEP and ART or their overlap covered more than 90% of the two-year follow-up for all of the couples in the study. Of 1,000 couples enrolled, we only saw four HIV transmissions. We used a counterfactual simulation model to quantify what might have been expected in these high-risk couples if we had not provided PrEP and we had not provided ART as aggressively as we did. And we estimated that 83 infections would have been seen. This was a 95% risk reduction in the, chance, in the chances of HIV transmission, a result that was highly statistically significant. If we split the population up into groups, the HIV risk was reduced more than 90% among couples with HIV negative men, couples with HIV negative women, and couples that were less than 25 years of age. And the four cases that we saw, none of them used PrEP, either because they declined it or because they had not been adherent. Thus, this is a demonstration project of PrEP, uh, the first in Africa to demonstrate the, its effectiveness uh, outside of a clinical trial setting. And we observed virtual elimination of HIV transmission. Scale up of programs like this that provide PrEP in combination with other important prevention strategies, including treatment as prevention, could have a substantial impact on the African epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, and good news indeed. Um, I think, you know, a very important point to note is that in just about every demonstration project that has gone outside of clinical trials, where PrEP has been offered open label, we've seen better adherence. So, you know, I think that theme, um, again, you'll see at this conference, and we're certainly seeing an increasing amounts of uh, information in that regard. Discordant couples, very important population, but of course you, you've already heard 2,000 odd young women uh, and adolescent girls being infected in this country every week, and, and you know we have to do something about that. So um, I am very pleased to introduce to you now Catherine Gill. Uh, she's a medical clinical trialist, uh, comes from my center in Cape Town, um, and has been leading a, a, a small demonstration project called Plus Pills, um, and it is really the first Southern African open label study to offer PrEP to adolescents under the age of 19. Um, and so we'll ask Catherine Gill just to give some oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Linda Gill. So firstly, just to say that uh, we're very passionate about adolescents in, in Cape Town. And sadly, one of the major themes that will emerge from this conference is how young people, and especially young women, remain disproportionately affected by HIV. In South Africa, adolescent girls are up to eight times more likely than their male peers to have HIV. And adolescents are the only age group in which AIDS deaths rose between 2001 and 2013. If we want to bring an end to AIDS, we cannot leave this group behind. So in this context, and following on from the successes seen with oral prep in, in adults, a South African team headed by Professor Becker embarked on a study called Plus Pills to try and understand if oral PrEP would be safe and acceptable to adolescents. The study is being funded by the National Institutes of Health and is being conducted in two sites in South Africa, in Masipumalele in the south of Cape Town and Soweto in Johannesburg. 148 young men and women aged 15 to 19 were enrolled into the study after ascertaining that they were at risk for HIV and obtaining consent from a parent if they were less than the age of 18. They were each provided with oral PrEP using a novel study design that allows them after three months of use to be able to opt in or opt out based on personal choice. Our study is ongoing and we are presenting early results of this conference. We found that more than 50% of our participants had an SDI or had engaged in condomless sex at the beginning of the study. Despite low levels of knowledge around PrEP in our communities, we saw good uptake initially However, we also saw a de decrease in adherence at three months, probably due to pill fatigue and the impact of side effects. 
and we think that more support will be needed at this time. The side effect profile has been similar to that seen in adults. After three months, 90% of our participants chose to continue with PrEP. Those that opted out quoted reasons like side effects, size of the pill, and difficulty remembering to take it. For the first time, we have something to offer adolescents besides condoms, and we will continue to try and understand what motivates adolescents to make the choices they do, and how we can keep them safe during this very unique time of their lives. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and you know, keeping on the, the important theme of adolescence, another uh, colleague who is a passionate advocate of finding answers for adolescents, but now moving to men who have sex with men, particularly in the United States of America, Sybil Hosek comes from the Adolescent Trials Network and from Chicago. And she's showing data we've all been waiting for, actually for quite a long time. It's a, stu a study called ATN113. Um, and she'll be presenting at a late breaker later today. So I'll hand over to Sybil to give some comments. Thank you, Linda Gale. Thank you for allowing me to speak today on ATN 113, which is a PrEP demonstration and safety trial that was sponsored by NIH through the Adolescent Trials Network for HIV interventions. And in addition to the, to the PrEP, um, the Pills Plus protocol that Catherine just talked about, this is the only adolescent, exclusively adolescent focused PrEP protocol in the United States. Participants for this trial were young men, HIV negative, between the ages of 15 and 17. And of note, participants in this trial did not require parental consent to participate in this study. They were allowed to consent for themselves. Study visits occurred at baseline, then they came in monthly for the first 12 weeks and then quarterly thereafter. We enrolled a diverse sample of 79 young men with an average age of 16 and a half. About a third of them identified as being of mixed race, about 29% black, 21% Latino. PrEP was really well tolerated with minimal adverse events. In fact, we had no discontinuations um, reported due to side effects. At baseline, about 15% of the adolescents had an STI. That declined over the course of the study to about 12% at week 24 and 11% at week 48. Importantly, for the first 12 weeks of the study, the majority, over 95% of participants, had detectable levels of drug in their system. And even more importantly, over half of those had highly protective levels, more than four or more doses per week. At the week 24 visit, though, we start to see a pretty drastic decline in those protective levels and an increase in participants who are not taking the medication at all. And that drop off obviously corresponds with going to quarterly visits. We did have three HIV seroconversions while on study, which actually gives us a calculated incidence of 6.41 per 100 person years. This is obviously very high for a demonstration project, but I think that in conjunction with the STIs tells us that in the absence of PrEP, there would have likely been more infections and highlights the absolute need for access to PrEP for those under the age of 18. I am pleased to announce um, that Gilead Sciences is committed to pursuing an indication among those under the age of 18 and that the data from this study will be going to the US FDA for consideration of a label change to allow adolescents access. I think it's really important, and I'm often a broken record in saying that we need developmentally appropriate strategies for PrEP implementation, and it may very well be that we need to see adolescents more frequently. We may need more interim contacts with them, and we may need different retention and engagement strategies, but the access and ability for them to get to PrEP is very, very important. Thank you. Thanks, Sybil. So I think, you know, you'll agree that um, an interesting lineup of studies and the, the Room is now open for questions. Please just state your name and where you're from and, and, and to whom the question is directed. We'll start in the front here. Am I on? Yes. Oh, good. Michael Smith, Med Base today. My question is for Dr. Baden. Um, this is a demonstration project. Uh, it follows on, obviously, from Partners Prep. And I, I'm curious. What we've seen in the last couple of days, the final results of, of HBTN052, the partners study in, in Europe, uh, all suggest that when AR, ARVs are taken 
uh, as, as directed, there is no transmission at all. Um, you're seeing four transmissions, but uh, in, in the period when they would have been not on ARVs, but using PrEP. Is that, is that right? I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, so the, the four transmissions that we saw appear to be in the absence of both ART and PrEP. That they are either individuals, they're, they're all individuals who are not taking PrEP either because they declined it or because they weren't adherent. And they weren't exposed to ART either because the a HIV positive partner had declined treatment or because the couple had separated and it appears that the transmission is coming from outside. So none of these look like they're breakthrough infections to either treatment as prevention or PrEP. Okay, so the, taking all of these studies together, what can we say about the, the, the preventive effect of PrEP slash ARTs? Oh, both, prep, both PrEP and ART are extremely potent strategies with that, that can virtually eliminate transmission. The key is, the key is access, so people, so access to both treatment and PrEP, and then the support to be able to take them. What we provided in this demonstration project was PrEP as a cover when ART was being started or when ART was delayed and then started thereafter. Because not everyone will start ART immediately, even within a committed relationship, and we use PrEP to cover that period. Thank you so much. My name is Jeremiah Johnson. I work at Treatment Action Group in New York. Um, my question is uh, for Scott McAllister. Um, so, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on um, the racial breakdown of the data within the study that you're referring to. Um, I also wonder if there are any efforts to try and capture uptake amongst transgender people um, within the United States, uh, any, any uh, data collection with that. And finally, if there are any new efforts on behalf of Gilead to address the disparities and the poor uptake within certain high priority groups and high priority regions um, to, to try and facilitate that. Uh, so, uh, race is difficult to quantify and I don't have an answer today because uh, the way that we get these data is from uh, prescriptions and obviously we don't write race on a prescription pad. Uh, when we compare it against uh, the medical claims database, sometimes race is written, sometimes not. So for the entire database of 79,000 individuals who started PrEP in the last four years, we only have race on some, so I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to make any draw any conclusions. Uh, but I can say that it does uh, appear to be disproportionately uh, white, um, much more so than the actual percentages of the epidemic inside the United States. Um, in terms of uh, uh, quantifying transgender, kind of the same problem. Uh, we don't really know exactly. Um, and, and your third question was. Oh, yeah, so um, we've, we've been um, providing educational grants uh, to uh, individual community agencies around, around the country that are interested in um, doing local work to uh, improve implementation within communities. Um, we, we kind of, uh, once they apply for the grant, they get free reign to do what they think is necessary for their individual community. That program's been going on for a couple of years and we anticipate continuing it, um, and we're uh, certainly welcoming um, uh, agencies within these uh, underserved areas, particularly in the, the southeast. Um, Liz Heileman from HIV and Hepatitis.com and AIDS Map. My question is also for Scott. Um, I'm wondering, since the uh, the number of women have, have stayed more or less stable throughout the uh, throughout the study, whereas the, the, the men, I'm presuming mostly gay men, have increased a lot. Um, do you think there's sort of a, a, sort of a pool of women that might be um, interested in or suitable for taking PrEP that aren't taking it, or do you think this fairly small number is um, maybe the limit of the number of women who, who think PrEP is right for them? Um, I think that's probably some editorial, that would need some editorializing on my part, but I, I, I do think that um, uh, in terms of access to care and heterosexual women in, who may not necessarily recognize that they are at risk, um, whereas um, within the MSM community and the transgender community, there's a lot more um, 
uh, information out there right now uh, and uh, a lot more peer-to-peer -peer discussion, I believe, of uh, um, the need to, to do prep. Um, the other thing I think is, is also um, applicable to women is uh, the touch points where women might access health care, whether it's an OBGYN or a primary care physician, a lot of those docs are not necessarily um, as versed in PrEP as some of the sexual health clinics where gay men might be going or um, HIV specialist providers where, where um, gay men or HIV negative also might be going. And uh, so one of the other things that we are doing is try to, trying to improve education among healthcare providers in, in those areas. Hi, um, Mike Kavanaugh, I'm covering it for out.com and I work for HIV Experience Resources Organization. Um, we're a site for prevention. And my question is, are you doing any correlating studies with increases of other STDs in key areas where you're delivering PrEP? And is there any research happening? And how are you gonna address that when delivering PrEP? Because it seems in some key areas there is a increase in other STDs. Is that directed at anyone in particular? Or? Right, like so who, who, anybody wanna pick that up? STIs and PrEP, Sybil? I can speak for our, both of our studies. Um, in the adolescent study, obviously we saw a decrease in STIs over time as well as a decrease in self-reported sexual risk behavior, number of partners, number of episodes of condomless sex. In our 18 to 22 year old cohort, which we reported on last year, we really saw um, not an increase, but a stable, kind of a stable trend of STIs over time. And kind of reflecting that participants were coming in with a high baseline rate of STIs that didn't increase over time, but that their behavior continued to be about the same, or at least their exposure to STIs over time seem to be about the same. I will also say that identification of these STIs has largely been through, at least in the MSM community, through rectal swabs, which are often asymptomatic infections and likely might not have been found had these participants not been involved in a PrEP study. So I think there has been some um, data sh kind of leading to the, to the idea that there are increased STIs, but I do think we have to consider that we're doing a better job screening in our PrEP programs than someone with an asymptomatic STI infection may never be tested um, for that STI. So I, I think it's a little bit murky, um, that's my interpretation of it right now. Oh, sorry. Um, Julia Maju from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age in Australia. Um, my question is for Catherine Gill. Uh, I'm keen to know what um, you think needs to happen next. I know that these are very early results, but they're looking quite positive. Um, is, is PrEP expensive? Is it funded in your country? How could you actually um, get this out to the people who, or to the adolescents who need it, need it most? Uh, thanks for the question. So uh, PrEP is expensive and it isn't currently funded in, uh, in South Africa. So we have quite a few um, project starting now uh, at, at many sites over South Africa uh, scaling up PrEP access for adolescents and young women. So maybe I'll just add that th these are donor type programs, again demonstration projects, um, and so I think we are still, we, we're in lots of conversations with the South African government, as you heard our health ministers just launched a an adolescent girls and young women project. I think they are very interested in trying to understand how PrEP fits into that. I think it, the feeling is that there are still some implementation aspects that are, aren't entirely clear. So I think the sex worker program is kind of first phase in a phased rollout in which adolescent girls and young women certainly are on the agenda but not there yet. So I think we, we're waiting to hear. Right. Thanks. Uh, this is Jeffrey Carr from The Economist. It's it's not so much a question, it's a clarification, and really end with Dr. Backer. Um, I think you said that the UNAIDS suggest, figures suggested we're 2% of the way to 3 million, and yet uh, I reckon that 80,000 is near 3% there already, and that's just the US. But where did the UNAIDS figures come from? We have to <laughs> ask Carl Dene that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's 3% in admittedly one very large country, then you know, add in the rest, you might be near a four or five. 
could well be, and um, I think we should pose that question to the UNAIDS report. Robert Summer from JAMA. I, it, it was interesting, this could be to anybody on the uh, panel, but the idea that you have better adherence outside of clinical trials and demonstration projects, usually the other way around with a lot of medications. I'm wondering if a number of you wanted to comment on what you think that means and why that is. I'll ask Jared to pick that one up. It, it's quite a surprise, and I think in, for those of us who have done many clinical trials or, or have read about, about clinical trials for years, we one would think that the population most committed would be the clinical trial population. But I think what we've seen now repeatedly, and PrEP has emphasized this repeatedly, is that knowing that something works and knowing you're getting the real deal and knowing that it is safe makes a huge difference in terms of adherence. And in clinical trials, we, in the clinical trials against a placebo, we couldn't say that. We didn't know if it worked. We didn't know if you were getting the real deal and we couldn't tell if it was safe. And particularly for a younger person, a younger woman who's thinking about her own safety and her future fertility, for example, the, the commitment to something that was unproven might not have been there. But now we have consistently seen in, in really every geography where PrEP has been tested that adherence and the benefits from adherence to PrEP have been better in the open label studies than they had been in the clinical trials. And that's in every single population. Hi, uh, Ed Sussman with MedPage today. Uh, you know, we've talked about the expense of uh, Truvada being used. How expensive is it? What, what, are, what are we actually looking at in cost? And I just want to ask uh, Catherine Gill whether uh, you had any results as far as infections were concerned as a serial conversion? Okay, so I'll take the second question. Um, we've, uh, we've had no serial conversions on our study up to date, but we are, we're probably about mid-study at the moment. The, the time frame, uh, we started enrolling about a year ago. So some of our participants are starting to exit, and others are just through their first three months. Um, and then the question of cost. That obviously vary, varies geographically, but Scott, I don't know if you want to pick that up. So um, within the US, um, uh, Truvada for PrEP is covered by third-party insurance. It's also covered through the Affordable Care Act through, through Medicaid expansion. Um, Gilead does have a program inside the U.S. to, to assist with co-pays and also uh, with people who are underinsured, uh, such that everyone who, who lives in a state that has Medicaid expansion should be able to a access uh, Truvada for PrEP. Outside the U.S., um, we do work with, with governments to try and uh, come up with uh, fair pricing, um, and we do have a large access group that works with um, uh, developing world nations to uh, work through uh, local licensing agreements for generic manufacturers to make Truvada available uh, at, at, at substantial reductions in costs. And it's, it's variable, of course, by geography. I can give you some context to you're here in Durban, you're spending rand. If it, we're waiting for the generic companies to also uh, be licensed by the medicine uh, con council here, but it'll be about uh, 250 rand a month. Um, on, on generic pricing, should should that come through? Hello, my name is Pablo Linde, uh, Spanish for El País. Uh, a couple of questions. First uh, of them, you said that you want to start spreading uh, prep uh, from this conference. Uh, do you have any figure uh, about how many countries are there actually use, currently using prep, and if you have any forecast? This is the first one. The second one, uh, for any other who can answer, have you realized any uh, people leaving condoms because they are using PrEP? Are, are you afraid of this possibility? Thank you. So I can, I can answer the question about the countries. Um, uh, Truvada for PrEP is approved in the United States, Canada, Australia, Peru, Kenya, and South Africa. 
and there are pending reviews in a number of other countries, such as Brazil, Thailand, I'm trying to remember everything, uh, well, uh, and Europe. Um, within the European Union, uh, the EMA is reviewing the file right now, and uh, we anticipate a decision for Europe within the next few months. I guess in terms of where do we want it to go, this is a pandemic. Um, this is a prevention tool, and we're trying to reduce HIV infections. So, I, you know, I, mean, I don't know if, there, if anything's been said about exactly whether there's any part of the world you don't want it to go to. <laughs> no, well, we're, we're actually going to be filing it in the, in the Dreams Project countries as well, uh, and quite a few other countries that, I, that it's just too, too long to m mention right now. So, Sybil, I don't know if you want to pick up the condom question and, and maybe others can also comment about that. It, I mean, it, can, it becomes a tricky question, right? People that are using condoms well, um, PrEP really isn't of interest to them. Really what we're seeing in the studies as well as in clinical care are people coming in that really are struggling to use condoms. Um, and that's evidenced by the rate of STIs that we're finding when they're coming in into care. So these are people that condoms, for what many reasons, were not really acceptable to them. And even though PrEP does not protect against those STIs um, moving forward, at least they're being protected from HIV. Um, so, you know, I think that there may be some decline and in, in kind of event to event in condom use, but those are really among people who really we're having trouble with condoms to begin with. Because that's what we're seeing in clinical care. I don't know, Jared, if you have anything else to add to that. I think across PrEP studies and across populations, what Sybil says is true, that people who aren't using condoms already, in spite of information and education to, about the importance of condoms, people who are struggling to use condoms, are the, are the most interested in taking PrEP and do the best from it. And use PrEP then as a prevention strategy along with doing their best at condoms. But it's not that condom use reduces, it's that individuals already not using condoms are the best candidates for PrEP. We see this also in couples, even in this demonstration study, known serodiscordant couples, two thirds of them weren't using condoms when the study started. Many of them use PrEP. They did not get HIV. And uh, I think one uh, very positive outcome of the demonstration project, we had about uh, one in five women became pregnant every year, which for these couples was a high priority. Um, hi, my name is Alex Garner with uh, Unicorn Booty in the U.S. My question's for Sybil. Um, uh, in regards to the young uh, gay men, particularly the young gay men of color that were a majority of the study, you saw the drop-off rate happen after the few um, uh, quarters that they were, they were on it. I was wondering if you could speak to sort of some lessons gleaned from that in terms of community support or family support. Uh, knowing that young gay men in particular wouldn't have the sort of structural community or family support that might be really important to sustain adherence um, and commitment to PrEP. Thanks. And, and just to note in this study, actually, we did not see any racial differences in terms of the drop-off, that you know, all the participants dropped off at, at that quarterly visit mark, regardless of race or ethnicity. Uh, which is actually different than our 18 to 22 year old study where we really saw African Americans struggle more. Um, there are, for these, um, for these kids, it's a, it's a struggle. Many of them, in fact most of them, still live at home, yet they don't necessarily live with um, families that are supportive of their sexual identity, that they're certainly not necessarily out to their families. And so in that way, sort of having that structure of, of living at home impedes their adherence in, in some ways because they have to find ways to, to keep their medication to um, justify why they have it or, or to hide it. Um, I think we have to do a lot more in terms of education, um, just, in, just in terms of knowledge that this is even an option. You know, when we were recruiting from this study, we would go into high schools and talk about PrEP and, and people would say, you're, you're lying, there is no pill that prevents HIV. I mean, this was just completely foreign to them. And we're not that far off from that point, and that was you know, only a couple of years ago. So we do need to do a lot more um, in that regard. I think peer mentorship can go a long way um, for young gay men. One of the things that these young men, who many of whom were not out to even their friends, and were really just exploring their sexual identity at this age, which is really developmentally appropriate, 
this was the first time that they were able to come in and speak to someone about having you know, gay sex, sex with other men. Um, and so that's something that you know, we, we really don't offer to young people um, outside of the context of you know, kind of medical care. And that kind of support, I think, goes a, really a long way. And, and many of the young men in our qualitative follow-up interviews spoke to the relationships that they had with the study staff and with the counselors um, and with the nurses and doctors as really being the highlight of the study to them because this was such a unique experience to be in an environment where they could be supportive um, as they explored their sexual identity. Uh, if we could have you sell, thank you. Great. Uh, Jeremiah Johnson from Treatment Action Group again. Um, a follow-up question about the, the pricing for um, Scott. Um, it, it, Correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that the price is, in the U.S. is around $17,000 a year for the cost of Truvada. Um, and my question around the coverage is uh, that you said that it's covered by a lot of plans under the Affordable Care Act. The maximum allowable out-of-pocket cost, um, I believe it's, it's set annually. I think it's at $6,800 or $6,850 right now. Um, the Gilead Copay Assistance Plan only covers up to $3,600. Are there any plans to match the maximum um, out-of-pocket costs um, allowed under the ACA because that seems like something new that might help increase access for a number of, of people uh, who hit mid-year and, and max out that copay plan. So I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I'm not um, uh, aware of those discussions. I'm, I'm kind of on the medical side, and uh, but uh, I'm happy to take the question back and try to find out. Um, Linda Gale, this is another question for you. Um, I'm interested to know whether, um, on the scale of priorities, how PrEP sits against getting treatment to people, and is there a kind of awkward tension um, here in South Africa around that conversation, especially when you get to government funding and questions about, you know, what you're going to do first and how many people will benefit? Uh, it's, it, it's, it's the big question, and, and certainly, you know, for the last numbers of years, the focus has been squarely on treatment and trying to get to that six million, and particularly now we're going to universal test and treat. But I think, I, I think it was very interesting, and it was interesting to hear the head of our HIV and ST program speak about this at a meeting, I think on one day of this week, <laughs> um, where he mentioned that as WHO has recommended that both you know, we move to universal test and treat and PrEP. So the South African government is taking that stance that, um, you know, it can't be one or the other. And so in the sex workers program, we're offering, offering universal test and treat to those sex workers who are already infected and offering them PrEP to those who are not infected. And so I think that is very much government's stance in terms of we have to turn off incidents. Um, particularly in groups where incidence is so high. So I don't think they're thinking about it as a general population intervention because we have 53 million people here and with our force of infection, you know, but it can we hone in on which populations where that makes a lot of sense. And, and clearly, I think, you know, after sex workers, um, men who have sex with men, then adolescent girls and young women certainly need to be in there. I think what, what the country is grappling with is, is there a risk profile? Now, I hope what you heard from Catherine was when we, we hardly, had, all we said is will sexually active young women come forward, we, we actually got quite a high risk profile right there. Um, you know, these were young women who already had asymptomatic STIs, half of them were finding it diff difficult to use condoms. So, you know, that seems to be right the population we need to do. So, I think it is, it's in the investment case. It isn't at the top of the list of the investment case for the whole country. But I think when we break out these specific groups, then it definitely goes up um, in, in ranking. And so I think you know the next few months can be really critical for the country to figure out with the Department of Treasury how we are going to actually fund this going forward. Um, I, you know, something needs to be done. I think that's clear, and it's just really what that thing is. There is the same kind of concept of the universal test and treat to the men who are infecting those women. Our problem has been really reaching those men and getting them into the health services and making sure that they're virally suppressed. But the idea is to have a two-pronged approach, if you like, in that regard. 
So my great pleasure, thank you to a wonderful panel, thank you for the interest um, and I hope the rest of the conference goes uh, really well for all of you. Thanks so much everybody.